Joe, I am as always, Chad Joe. How are you? How have you been? You know, summer's starting and I'm worried about you. Uh, you don't write, you don't call. Let me just say it, what the fuck is your problem? Uh, we're coming to you live as we do from the West Side Comedy Theater here in the West Side of Los Angeles. And if you're ever out here, you want to see a comedy show, you want to see the sketch, the improv, the occasional stand-up, this is the place for you. Uh, go to the uh, westsidecomedy.com, is that there? That is correct. Sure, westsidecomedy.com. Sammy, Jamie, Jamie was uh, not present last no. Sunday. That's all right. She was celebrating uh, just a Mother's one Day. Mother's Day with, with her <laughs> with own my, damn with mother. With my mother. Yeah, you found a mother. <laughs> Turned out it was yours. Uh, yes. Welcome back. You, there's no mistaking that she's my mother. We look very similar. Well, okay. Well, other than the fact, like, I'm half, you know. Considerably younger. Considerably younger. Yeah. But you know the, the old thing. 42 where you, years younger. You're dating someone, exactly. you're getting serious, and you just want to see her mother. Because you want to know what the future is going to be. Sure. So if I were to look at the small Asian man that your you know mother looks like, this. I would not think. Hmm? She, so you know she watches this, and whatever you say, I'm going to get in trouble for. Oh, okay. Well, then I take that back. And happy delayed Mother's Day. <laughs> I, I called her on her birthday. She knows I love her. And yeah. also that that reference has been made a time or six. She used to, um, my sister's. Yes. She's had the same haircut since I've been Spock. born. And she looks like Dr. Spock. And then, because it's like just short, dark hair. Again. <laughs> we had this last week. We had this I called him Dr. Spock. That is Mr. Spock. Yeah. Dr. Spock is the pediatrician. Dr. Spock wrote a book. Dr. <laughs> Bones. <laughs> Bones McCoy. Bones you know Dr. what it McCoy. is? I got the Beastie Boys lyric stuck in my head. Oh. So That's what it was. Man. They haunt you. Oh, they got Mr. Spock. oh it is Mr. Spock. Yeah. Uh, so she got the Mr. Spock haircut many years ago. Why did I say doctor? I probably, you know why? <laughs> nest egg. That's exactly why. Because you say it. It's, it's nest egg. It's how <laughs> how <laughs> much track. of the chat shows from now until end can we make devoted to the doctor, Mr. Spock? <laughs> confusion? I'm going to say weekly, fucko. How about that? <laughs> Uh, no, but this is what, so Kev, yes, uh, Kevin likes to get everything slightly wrong, so it's perfect that he would say Dr. Spock. The most recent example was whenever we <laughs> saw Guardians of the Galaxy 2, and he had to leave early, and he leaned over to me and said, I gotta go, let me know what the nest egg is. What the and nest I'm, egg is. And I'm like, what? And I'm like, oh, Easter he means egg. Easter egg. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> but right. you do stuff like that all the time. <laughs> let me know. What the nest egg is. Uh, another Guardians one. By the way, I didn't leave early, I left during the credits. Which is technically early. Yeah, I just want to make clear I uh, also, let the film finish. Also, speaking of Guardians of the Galaxy, he said in the presence of Chris Pratt once, huh, Skylord. 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 Call him Skylord to his face. Call him Skylord. Yeah, hey, I like your character, Skylord. Yeah, it's Starlord, old man. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. Hey, guess what? I'm aging. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that time you told Mark Hamill you loved him as Luke Skykiller? <laughs> <laughs> The problem is, I tell the story when my, I introduced my father to George Lucas and he met him and shook his hand and said, I loved E.T. So this is clearly a family tradition. There you go. Just keeping it alive. Uh, when did I become my father? Not too long ago. Uh, and welcome back to uh, this side of the country, Sam Levine. Thank you. Happy to be back. I'm sorry I missed you while in the New York area. I know. It was sad, but like I said, we see plenty of each other out here. It's, You're not wrong. No, we, we didn't. It's fine. The family was sad, but they're always sad. But you had fun and you saw things and did people. That's exactly correct. Okay, good. That is exactly correct. Did you make it to a ball game? I did. I made it to a Mets-Angels game, of all things. Ah. The Angels followed me west, or east. You gotta ask why. Uh, I well, I d I'm not a particular fan of either ball no, club, no. but uh, ball club. dear dear friends of mine uh, wanted to see a, a a game, and so that was the only game in town. Are these imaginary friends? No, they were real. I posted okay. a, a photograph uh, on the online uh, Instagrams. Ah, uh, oh, great. Yeah. If you said ball club like Mr. Burns would. Sure did. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome back. Thank you. Happy to be here. Very excited uh, to be here for today's guest. I was in the New York. Um, it's been announced on, on the uh, social media. I'm uh, uh, recurring on the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, a new Amazon series that was picked up to two seasons from Pilot, which is the first for them. And what is... Uh, what does our dear friend Brian Doyle Murray say about recurring? Oh, yeah, recurring. I love recurring. They're always happy to see you. Yes. Yeah. I think, uh, I think the person that's most upset that you got this role, though, is Richard Kind. Yeah, Richard Kind. I don't understand. I live down the street. <laughs> if they want an old cranky Jew, they could have hired me. Oh, it's Amazon. I'm already on there. 
Uh, <laughs> recent guest, if you want to check out this show, if you're wondering just what the fuck, and you tuned in for our guest today and you have no idea what's happening, uh, recent guest, Christopher Guest, there's a guest, Lauren Graham, Billy Bob Thornton, Rob Riggle, J.K. Simmons, Craig Ferguson, and Dave Foley, upcoming, Rob Cordry, Dave Keckner, Dave Couillet, and recently reconfirmed, actually a couple of nights ago, I may have had dinner with him, don't make a big deal out of it, Ricky Gervais, October 29th, very fucking excited, he's coming to town to do some stand-up, and uh, man, he loves to make fun of me being a Jew, to my face, mm -hmm. sends me photographs of, uh, of cats with a little Nazi mustache and its paw. Sends me photos of that. <laughs> Thinks it's the funniest thing that's ever happened. Uh, all right, I've got a piece of fan mail, but I feel we've spent too much time. Oh, much love and strength to our super incredible intern, Brian McCauley, who's in the hospital of a horrific accident involving a drunk driver. This just happened. Oh, no. Yeah, we got this news right before we went live. He owes me 20 bucks. Wow. <laughs> He would love that joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too soon. Never a factor on this show. Uh, all of our love and strength is yours, Brian. Uh, keep us updated on everything. And uh, uh, those of you who want to write to us and find out more, kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. Speaking of which, uh, I recently watched your 2016 film, Late Bloomer. It's a film I talked ad nauseum on the show, uh, having a direct, and was surprised to see that there were many, many significant similarities to your main character and me. Huh. For the last almost 10 years, I've been dealing with the uh, after effect of having a pituitary tumor with issues such as late puberty and self-discovery. I'm pretty dumbfounded by the accuracy of your main character's experience as it relates to my own personal life, and I wonder how you came up with this story. Easy, it was a book. Uh, and a screenplay that others wrote based on a true story in the book uh, that I then uh, uh, directed. The biggest shocker was one of the final scenes in your film. Your character declares his love for the woman in this film, spoiler alert, by playing a song, Head Over Heels by Tears for Fears, a song that I fell in love with some months before your film was released. Well, that's just happenstance. I can't help yeah, you on that, that one. that song from like 1985? And <laughs> welcome to 1985. Granted, um, that is my favorite Tears for Fears. I know, right? I'm just taken aback and wondered if this storyline was derived from someone in your own life. And now you have an answer, and, uh, and good luck with your speedy recovery from 10 years ago. Uh, write to us again, kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. My guest today, uh, uh, well, I'm unbelievably excited. We, we exchanged some pleasantries on the, uh, on the Twitter and got, and got cut up a little bit. And then um, our own Samantha Ward, makeup artist of the stars. Woo! Indeed, working on a film with him, uh, mentioned, uh, I believe, last Sunday. Yeah. And uh, we jumped all the fuck over that, and here he is. Please welcome Vincent D'Onofrio. Vincent! Yay! Now, I, I don't remember from our time together on the set of a motion picture years ago whether there's a truncated version or if it's just Vincent all the time of your name. No, it's Vincent. It is Vincent. Yeah. It felt right. My sisters call me Vinny. Because because I've been around them a long time. And they can get away with it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And when others try? Um, I'm fine. Uh-huh. Yeah. What are you going to do? I'm glad you don't have name issues because I've been dining on one particular story, which I will not tell unless you're <laughs> no. interested in telling it. No. No? No. But, but okay. I told it to you? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, from New Boys. Yes, Boys. Yes, from uh -huh. New Boys, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You did tell it to me. And uh, man, I've dined on that one. That's just a, <laughs> it's a, good story. a wonderful, spectacular example. I think I used it in a script. For a sketch I wrote. I in did. a sketch? Yeah. I, had a, I had a sketch where I had this particular person as an Uber driver. And yeah, that's right. Any, and they, yeah, Lucky and they corrected him. Lucky on the first day. <laughs> yeah. That's double guns, as I recall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, shooting El Camino Christmas presently. That, that term, though, I have to say that that term, lucky we caught it on the first day. <laughs> the, the Austin or the south of her Austin accent yes. is very distinct, and I've used it since then. And I, became, I first fell in love with it because of that phrase, lucky we caught it on the first day. <laughs> That that little served you. inflection served me well. Yeah. Yeah. Was there a little of that in the Magnificent Seven? No, no that was a different kind. But of. there's a little bit in the thing that we're doing now. Uh huh. Yeah. This El Camino Christmas thing I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. Are you at liberty to speak about that? Yes. Sure. It's a Ted Melfi production, 
and uh, we like him. Yeah, and uh, Luke Grimes is playing the lead in it, and Dax Shepard and uh, Tim Allen's in it. It's a, it's, it's a really good cast. Eclectic, and it's a it's a comedy drama about this kid that comes into this small town and everything goes wrong. I like it already. Especially my character goes wrong for him big time. Aha. Uh -huh. Is the word menacing used? Um, he's just a fucking jerk off, my guy. He's like, he's like a cop and he's just bad. He's just not nice. Uh. He gets a little itch that he can't scratch about Luke and he tries as hard as he can to destroy his life. <laughs> That's fun to play. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, so let's talk about the Twitter. Uh, following each other, and uh, I'm constantly amazed how many people you engage with. And it's a it's a unique way to use Twitter. Uh, in a not 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 fearless is not the right word because it's just it's and it's not confrontational. It's just what do you got? Bring it. Yeah, I'll I'll take all comers. Yeah. Uh, what is that experience like for you? When you're replying to... I mean, obviously the conversation that we're having now is going to go towards the trolls because that's when it gets heavy, right? So it's the trolls that they only, they, they're the only ones that make it heavy. The rest is just reaching out and connecting in like a positive way to people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, but so never engage trolls is the... No, I engage them. Yeah. I've, I've engaged them. Right. And, and it's, it's sometimes turned out good and sometimes not. Yeah. You know, sometimes they... It's the professional ones. There's some really good ones out there that I have to give you know respect to. They're really good. They know how to wow. push your buttons. Yeah. They're really amazing at it. You know, <laughs> and I, the thing I find about it that's strange though is that everybody on Twitter actually it affects them in some way, and and yeah, it doesn't affect me though, clearly because it's Twitter. Right. So it's you know if you've ever been in the alley with somebody who's particularly menacing and you have to actually engage them in a real way like when I was a kid then that that evokes real emotion and fear and sure. stuff but Twitter doesn't do it for me <laughs> like I just I just find it interesting that they're so good at it right they're so some horrible they're really horrible some of them like disgusting people but it's interesting and, you say they know how to push your but buttons. I'm not sure they're disgusting people they know how to push your buttons I'm not sure because I'd have to see them for real whether they're disgusting they're they playing could a just part be just perfectly fine people yeah you know they're playing a part this is the only way yeah. that they feel a sense of power and I guess well, they're if just you're engaging them, I promise you, they're feeling empowered. Yeah. Or they're just fucking about. Like, they're just... That'd be great. Yeah. It'd be great if they were just fucking about. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Then we'd all engage them. But it's really interesting when, when the really good ones get on. I take them all the way down. Like, I take them all the way as far as they want to go. Like, all the way to the edge. Yeah. <laughs> of, of their... Of their just... Bile. They're just so good. That I just, you know, I'm, I'm st struck, starstruck by them. <laughs> starstruck? Yeah, like I'm really struck by them. I, I really find it, and I, and I just let the compassion flow at them. I try to yes. flow oh, like I've, enormous amounts of compassion at I've them. I've been entertained. And, and it's, it's just, I just find it, they're so talented. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's a unique perspective that we've not heard, <laughs> honestly, and it's it's unbelievably fucking zen. Yeah, and I have to mention uh, Trowley. Trowley is this is this is just out of nowhere. Sure. But Trowley is a a mouse that my daughter and I invented when I was a kid, and I used to make poems about Trowley, the country mouse, and and they're really pathetic poems. And Pathetic in what way? He's just a country mouse, and you know he's oh trowley, oh trowley. It's like that. He sure. talks to himself, you know, and tries to bring up his his. Uh, he tries to be more than what he is, trowley. Okay. That that's what happened between my daughter and I in the in the poems. And then recently, I released a twenty-one tweet poem about him. On, on the Twitter. Oh, and oh, they came. And they came, yeah. And uh, so there's a bunch of people, <laughs> I'm, uh, by a bunch, I don't know how many that is, but that are going to have pizza today if I mention Trowley. 
So they I have to eat pizza. That's what they said. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you have found a way to control them. Well, they and did it now themselves. Let them it eat was pizza. all their idea. Yeah. So Damn. Like, yeah. Oh, well, uh, so occasionally I release these things. I release them in in song, uh -huh. and I release them in text at times. These poems, the these, trolley. These journals, they're kind of jur fake journals, either my fake journals, personal fake journals, or, or they're through another character's journey, yeah, journey in life. And, it, and you release them occasionally on Twitter. Mm -hmm. So go check those out, by the way. Is this your name, right? Am I yeah. remembering that correctly? Yeah. At uh, 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 Kenny. Could I trouble you for a little uh, cold water in the other chat show mug that was purposely left behind? <coughs> <laughs> so let's talk about the choices you made <clears throat> that I enjoyed endlessly. I, and I also I have to assume, I'm going to assume, it was singled out by many people who wrote about the Magnificent Seven. The character was uh, one of the few fully realized in the film. Jack Horn, yeah. Oh, fuck. So, where do you begin with someone like that? Well, with the script, obviously, but then where do you go? Well, I brought a little, a couple of little surprises that I knew that I wanted to, that I was going to have to just throw out there on the first day when they, when the camera's rolling that I didn't tell anybody about. Because I knew that if I said something, they would just say no. So I, I usually just don't say anything. Right. And uh, it's, it's, you, you're, I always, have that sense of okay, I'm about to get fired. Feeling, uh huh. You know, whether you have voices, and I know I'm on the right track. Surprises coming or not, you still have that feeling. No, uh -huh. only when I have like big surprises coming. Uh huh. Like the Men in Black, I nobody knew that I was going to move like that or sound like that. They didn't until the first day. No. Uh -oh. no, 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 no. Barry didn't know because Barry, you know, he doesn't like to talk about stuff. He likes to talk about everything, but what, what you're, you're going to do it, or how you're going to do it. Barry Sonnenfeld, the director. Yeah. And the extremely talented. Oh guy my! Yeah, yeah. Former guest of the show, love him dearly. Yeah, he's amazing. Um, so there, there is that. You know, where I brought a little gifts, but then something really interesting happened. Is is that once I got to know the direct director Antoine Fuqua um, on set, and um, a rapport, and a rapport started between like six of us guys, of the six of the seven, and we we started to write and especially Ethan Hawke and I and Chris, Chris Pratt and we started to write we started to write stuff for the movie hmm. and uh, um, Fuqua was just bring it on bring it on bring it on so this whole kind of thing started and and uh, but the voice the voice was one of those things that I knew I was going to just do it Surprise. and it was going to freak people out but yeah. I knew that I knew that somebody like Fuqua would get it and I knew the other actors would understand and yeah so I knew it would be okay well there are actors who understand and some that don't when these things happen yeah I, I have to point to myself the the first time Benicio del Toro speaks in the usual suspects yeah with a a voice that he chose that steals every scene he's in uh, he and the director Brian Singer had not told us either that that was going to happen and in the film, my he speaks, and my character says, what the fuck did he just say? Now, that's not me improvising. That's me breaking the scene and asking the director, what the fuck did he just say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And that's why you share the Oscar with Chris McCord. <laughs> that's exactly right. That's why I asked him to drop off the, 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 the little gold man at my house one out of 52 weeks. Um, that and six other lines, but yes. So, 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 does that occur also? Is everyone just? Um, I rarely do anything that is going to actually mess with other people's performance. Uh, that's yeah, of course. You know, it's like I, I don't think I've ever done anything actually that would mess with other, somebody else's performance. But you might not know that it would. In other words, it's all about intent, and your intent is to serve the character and serve the piece. Serve the story, yeah. And serve the story, and then also not fuck up your fellow players. Right, that's my intent. For sure. Yeah. And I'm, I have a pretty good meter when it comes to that, though. I pretty much know, because I've been fucked with a lot, like we all have. 
um, with showboaters and, and stuff. And let's, let's talk about one now. <laughs> no, no, we won't. No. I, I definitely have this thing where I do not ever mention names. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I, I finally put out a book, uh, and the decision was if people were great to me, I was going to champion them. Right. And a couple people were not, and I, I, spoke, I spoke about them. But I spoke about them because the situation was hilarious. Yeah. Not because, oh, look what an asshole this is. Yeah. Um, one of which passed away about four weeks before the book was going to come out. And the publisher called me and said, you sure you want to <laughs> tell that story? And I thought for half a second and said, you don't get a pass for dying. Um, because, again, it was hilarious. And there were lots of witnesses. I, you know, my thing is, is I have to wait longer. I think I have to wait till they all get older and they've forgotten what I did to them. Yes. So that they can't come back at me <laughs> yes. for, for calling them out. Excellent point. Yeah. Um, so when you found this character in the Magnificent Seven, and, and that's great that you guys were encouraged to keep writing stuff and creating. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. It, it, it really worked because a lot of good stuff in the movie came out of that stuff. Yeah. You know, a lot of stuff with the Pratt's character and, and definitely with Ethan's and my character. I mean, it, um, there are scenes that were definitely um, definitely there because of, of the work that we did uh, on our own. Do you prefer that? No. I actually like a good script, and yeah. if I read a script and agree to do it, I actually don't like to touch it. I don't like anybody touching it. You know, I don't like surprises like that, you know? Mm. But if it becomes like, like this whole open thing for everybody to, and that's what it was, for right. just everybody involved to kind of come in and make it, take it off the page and then do something even better with it. If it's, if it's that attitude, then I like to join, you know, join in. But uh, it's one of the things that I say to directors, you know, when they have a really good script is, I, you know, I hope it's not going to change. I would prefer for it not to change, you know. Right. And if it's going to change, please give me a heads up soon, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So when you just said, I don't like surprises, and then shortly before that you said, I came to the job with a couple of surprises. Yeah. How does that work? Well, because I wasn't changing dialogue. Right, people's cues. And I wasn't changing blo I wasn't changing story at all. I wasn't changing anybody's cues. I never do that. Right. I'm very good at that. I don't do it. I, I don't do it because I don't like it to be done to me. Right. You know? But if you're, if, if before you start actually working, and I know you know this, that if, if everybody is saying, okay, it's an open arena here, anything can happen when the camera's rolling, well, then there are no surprises because it's right. all, that whole thing is null and void. You have to, you expect surprises. Right. But if it's not that kind of a tone yeah. on set, then you, then then some kind of surprise that messes up three cues afterwards, mm -hmm. it's not welcomed. <laughs> yes. Yeah. My thing is, I love, I I think I love <clears throat> total freedom because unlike yourself, I'm an untrained professional. I learned <laughs> while I earned. Having come from stand-up comedy, I, 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 I'm not proud of this. I, but I consider you a great actor. Well, you're not known for your taste. That's um, true. <laughs> <laughs> you're right about that. <laughs> There's me displaying my ability to take a compliment. Um, I mean, I told you that when we first worked together, too. I yeah, I didn't you're... believe you then. On yeah, yeah. But, um, <laughs> but it felt good hearing it. Um, I think I enjoy freedom with never changing context or cues. I think I enjoy freedom like that and flourish until I work with a great writer and like I'm doing right now in this Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. These, this team did Gilmore Girls and all the episodes and they're just extraordinary. And they prefer that you don't change a syllable. And so I feel restricted when I hear that until I start saying these incredible words in this very specific order they were put in. And then I feel spectacular. That yeah. I've been given I totally get it. weaponry yeah. that I don't have. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And why mess with that? Yeah. And I also, these days, I also give warning. If I, if I have a, a thought, like one of these surprises that may interrupt another performance, I give a couple of weeks heads up to see if it's going to last. Like if everybody likes the idea still on the day wow. after a few, few weeks, yeah. then I'll do it. Like for instance, the last thing we shot the other day, we shot this scene 
and I'm sing I, I was singing in it. And um, that's not in the script. But I gave everybody a heads up a couple weeks, because they had to get the rights to the song. And you know, I, I sent the, I, I told Dax, Dax, I'm going to be singing in this thing, and you know, and so there was no negativity coming back at me, and there was like a good, good two weeks or more. Right. And so on the day, I just did it, but then also in a film, you know, on their coverage, I didn't sing, mm. so that I didn't screw up their, their sound and their, what they were, what they were doing. I, I. I sang only in parts that they wanted me to sing in so they could react to it. Sure. So I, you know, I think about all that stuff. And when you're young, you can't think of it because you just don't have the experience. Right. But when, but when you get older, you know how to make a movie and you know how it's done. And right. You can, yeah, I think you're irresponsible if you don't then, knowing how a film is made, if you don't then follow through with, yeah. cue, you know, not messing up people's cues, giving people a heads up and stuff like that. Yeah. But when it comes to my own performance, like in Magnificent Seven, um, I'm saying the lines that scripted, I'm doing, I'm doing the correct blocking, I'm not throwing anybody off. Right. I've altered my voice. And it's not a voice that's inarticulate. Right. <clears throat> you, yeah, you'll know what your cue is. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, it was... It's a long-winded answer to your no that's what the show is yeah <laughs> uh you would worked with uh, antoine on the brooklyn's finest is yes that right? we yeah. did a little scene yeah yeah um i also saw in the research you referenced uh in a conversation about doing a western the movie silverado which is one of my favorite westerns me too yeah oh my goodness yeah it's a very entertaining movie oh my yeah lawrence kasdan yeah doing it right what a great guy he was! Like when I when I when I met him, he was a really sweet guy. Yeah, very unassuming. Yeah. Kevin Costner in Silverado gives one of the yeah. most memorable star turns of a virtual unknown. Yeah. In memory. Yeah, he's so good. Like the, you knew he was going to be a major star. Yeah, the choices. Yeah. When uh, the yeah bad everything. thing. Yeah. Oh man. Hmm. Mm -mm. It's nice when you see that. There's been a few of those in our, yeah, in our time in this in this business, where we've seen performances where you look, like, okay, that he, guy. she is going to be. There's a made person right there in one scene. Yeah. Yeah. What the fuck did he just say? I believe was the one that everyone. <laughs> also. Um, okay, we have a. Uh, oh, first let's, let's talk about Denzel because uh, he, he's magical, and there is. Uh, uh, leadership quality that comes from him that whether you uh, gravitate towards that or are inspired by it it's undeniable and certainly within the context of the story of the film it's wildly necessary but I don't yeah. know what your experience was just working with him in well I mean I, I think you just put it really well I have a, a, a kind of a little bit of a history with him <clears throat> when I was a kid when we were both young actually um, we were invited to the Sundance Film Laboratory. He was there, um, he was already a major star, and, and uh, he was going around to the directors and giving them advice, that was his job there. And my job there was to be in one of the young filmmakers, play with the lead in one of the, one of the leads in one of the young filmmakers' mm -hmm. laboratory films that they were making at the time there. Um, and. We, there was a, there was a, uh, I had heard that he was going to, Denzel was going to speak in front of a bunch of the filmmakers and I just kind of made my way in because I wanted to hear what the guy had to say because I, I loved his stuff, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and he saw me, <clears throat> to, I don't want to get specific about it, but he, he gave me like a huge compliment in front of all these young filmmakers and I was like called out in a way that I never expected, you know. And, uh, and then he came afterwards and he was you know he's not he, he's not the kind of guy who wants to make friends or anything mm -hmm. you know and uh, he and he, he came out anyway and I, I thanked him and Courtney Vance was there that year too is an amazing actor wow. as well Courtney's amazing and uh, they and I remember thanking him for doing that and then we never we never saw each other again for many many years but then I saw Hurricane and I was so blown away by his performance in Hurricane that I asked my lawyer to find out his, how, where I could send a letter to him. 
and I wrote him a really long letter about it and just you know yeah I just praised him because I was you know and I've done that a few times with performers and actors in my career where I just out of the blue send them something and uh, he uh, and then you know I never heard anything back but then I ended up on set with him with Magnificent Seven and uh, and he is he's exactly that he is a he's a leader yeah. you know he he certainly has his way of doing things mm -hmm. and the the thing with him and I've met many actors like him is that they're so good at what they're doing that they make you they confirm what you're doing yeah because of their amazing talent and how much they've gotten away with it and how successful they are at it it confirms a lot of things for it, it confirmed a lot for me, uh -huh. even at my age and in sure. my experience, you know. And and so, um, when you're in a scene with him, the scene just it gets ri it rises up to this level, yes. and everybody stays there for the whole thing until the director says cut, and then it, you get back down to real life. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. But to have him in a scene, Duval is like that too. I would think so. You know, where it just every yeah. breath he takes while he's acting, right. every noise that comes out of him is just honest and pure and just, right. you just like, I'm so happy I'm here. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're like thanking the stars that you've had the opportunity to be up there yeah. during the scene, this Rarified raised. air. Yes, exactly. And it, and it is such a gift. He, it is, and, and, and Denzel is, uh, is, is, is like that. I mean, he's, when you're in a scene with him, you can't help but, um, you're going to be good because of how good he is. Yeah, yeah, you know? he makes you more confident. Yeah, and I remember the last day we were all riding our horses and they had some shot, uh, we ended up shooting in Santa Fe and, and we have to cross this river or something like that. And uh, you know, I see him riding up on his horse, he was in the lead, he, he's in the lead, so he, had the, he was the last one back to get back in his number one position. And as he's passing me, I'm looking at him, and you know, he's all in black, and he's on this fucking horse. I mean, it's like it's stunning. <laughs> it's you know? ridiculous. Yeah, ridiculous. And I'm like, I, you know, I just like really loud out to the rest of the guys. I said, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I said, he, he, Denzel Washington. I said, one of the best actors we have in this country, ever. Yeah. And he passes by, right? And he looks at me. And he, he, he rides by, and he, uh, he turned back, and he said, uh, only in this country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Beautiful. That's Denzel. That is. Yeah. Uh, I've uh, been second or seventh fiddle to giant, giant, giant movie stars. He's the only one who called up a couple of weeks before we started filming and said, we're supposed to be best friends in this movie. We should go out and have a meal. Yeah. It's a little tiny thing. It seems maybe trivial. The only time it ever happened. And what a difference it made. Yeah. Just to go out and spend a couple hours at Genghis Cohen on Fairfax. <laughs> he likes the uh, kosher Chinese? Sure. Okay. Still there, Genghis Cohen? I believe it is. Oh, bless him. Yeah, just sat there. Tell me your story, I'll tell you mine. Yeah, and, he's uh, like that. We were playing, our characters are supposed to be best friends in the thing. Yeah, yeah just at ease. Uh, and yeah, and he takes chances. He does little things. I mean, um, he, he he's just this for me. It's just a huge confirmation that everything that I've tried to execute over the years, right. you know, yeah, that it, it's not in vain, right? You know, just yeah. you see him do it, and it's like, okay, you know, thank God, <laughs> I've been on the right track. You yeah. Know, I, it's well, confirming, a, as you said. Yes. Yeah. That's an extraordinary feeling. Yeah. Um, so I mentioned to you before we started that I saw the short film you directed, Five Minutes, Mr. Wells. Mm. Um, you went to the Venice Film Festival with that? Or we was did. It, we it opened played, the. Yeah. We, it wasn't an ever in competition. Right. And it's. It's. But it's. It travels around. It still travels around, actually, to this day. And it's many years ago now. Um, and it opens festivals and, and things. There's, a, there's two prints. I have one at home and there's one that just goes all over. And uh, yeah. What was the genesis for doing that? I did Ed Wood mm -hmm. and they, it's not my voice doing Orson and Ed Wood. And it's, a, it's, it's very good though. As and a voice guy, I 
picked up on that. Yeah, and and I, you know, I knew that it had to be done, but I just didn't like it. There was something about it I didn't like. And it was such a small little thing that I didn't have the time. It I was had an doing odd affectation for sure. The voice that they used. No, I, I didn't like. I thought. I thought the. I thought that the his performance. I can't think of his name at the moment. Do you remember who it is? Who did was it, it Maurice Lamar? Yes. Think, yeah. Yes. <laughs> who's, who's just so good? I'm sorry, Maurice. Um, I thought he did great. And but it wasn't that. It was my own shit sure. that I couldn't deal with. Sure. That somebody had to do that for me that I couldn't deliver right. in that short a time. I, I just couldn't deliver it. And that, it just stuck with me. Sure. And it, the, the humility of that just, just hung with me. And so during the res research for that, I learned that he wrote that, the cuckoo clock monologue, and that he used to use that at dinners and, and stuff and to, to show off and, you know, and he actually brought it to the table when they were shooting the third man and, and, and st stuck it in there in the um, carousel scene when they're in that big carousel, him and Joe Cotton. And um, I, I just thought, it's, I thought it was fascinating because it's, it's a monologue with a, with a really amazing structure to it. And I, so I took the structure of the monologue and I made a short using the same structure about coming up with the monologue. Right. And and so that that was in my that was my mind and that was the idea. And this this great writer Will Conroy loved the idea and he said, Can I pen it for you? And he did and he delivered this great script and um, we built this set um, similar to the way that Wells used to do things where it was it was it was constructed four feet off the ground. It was a dressing room at uh, Shepperton Studios, we we redid a dress. Um, we rebuilt um, a dressing room. Did and, you and imagine it, or was it taken from? Well, it was taken from some photos, but not. It's not exact. Sure. And built it four feet off the ground, and, and built it so that it split in quadrants, and and also we had a Muslim ceiling to it, so that we could light through it, just like Wells used to do. So we did it just like. A Wells movie, which was so extraordinarily <coughs> fun. Yeah, and we black and white. we shot this thing. I wanted to, the reason why it was four feet off the ground because he could roll cameras on the cement studio floor and shoot at ground below ground level up, you know. And so we did the same types of things, and and uh, and it was great. You know, I had the, the Frank Prinzi, who's an amazing cinematographer. He, he came and he did it, and and uh, we shot it in four days. And four days. Yeah. Wow. Well, it was a lot of dialogue. Yeah. It's a great, great, great uh, piece of work, and um, I encourage you. So everyone. I felt better about doing that. I, I, I was fueled yeah. by my um, lack of ability on Ed Wood. You made good. Yeah, and I made good with myself, yeah. And you were no longer haunted. Exactly. That's pretty great. Yeah. Uh, that's one of the better reasons I've ever heard for doing something creatively. <laughs> yeah. Uh, get that particular monkey off. Yeah. Um, are you still in the process of doing The Kid? Yes. And where are we with that? We are casting Billy the Kid. That's where we're, we're there now, and I'm waiting for a particular actor to give me an answer. And this is something but that... But Ethan Hawke is going to play Pat Garrett. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, fic, it's a, uh, a factual story about... Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, but I turned it into a coming of age story. I put a fictitious young man between them, mm. who they meet, and he becomes a man through Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. They're two different people, good versus evil, and right. and complicated good versus evil stuff. And and he actually ends up there when Garrett kills Billy the Kid and stuff. It's it's uh, it has a working title called The Kid, but I don't know if it's going to be called that. But so we're waiting for. A, it's all finance. Lionsgate is doing it, and we're just waiting to to get the the right kid, oh, Billy the kid. The script from the script is from me, from my idea. Yeah, it's another idea I came up with. Yeah. Did you work with the writer? Uh, yeah, Andrew Lanham, that young writer, did a great job. It's a great script. <coughs> Everybody loves it. Little known so. fact: uh, Billy the Kid actually Jewish, very Jewish-looking, thick beard, big Cubs fan. 
I bet a lot of people didn't know this about I him. You probably didn't no. know this about him. Well, seems I like. sent this to Jason before you even said <laughs> it. Here it is. I said, I said to Jason, Sam was about to suggest himself. <laughs> Two seconds before you did. We've been doing this a long time. Yes. <laughs> hey, what, is, what age is this kid? Eight, nine, ten? The, the little guy? The little guy's like the, 14. The, the character you created yeah. who experiences 14. these two. Yeah. Sorry, Sam. Uh -huh. <laughs> But there's probably an older Jew somewhere in the story. <laughs> <laughs> what if you know any great... You're unavailable, Mr. Any, Maisel. Any great actor or older Jews. <laughs> uh -huh. um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about... Uh, about the men in black and the Barry Sonnenfeld and the character that uh, was a, a, had a few surprises to it. We have a, a, a segment on the show called Famous Questions where I, I ask someone famous that you worked with to write a question for you. And this one comes from Barry Sonnenfeld who asked, what actor director were you impersonating, impersonating or inspired by in Men in Black? Um, he has an answer, so I don't know if the two of you talked about it. No? So he was guessing? I don't know what his answer is. John Houston. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Oh, so then you must have told him at some point. I don't know. Oh. I don't remember ever speaking to Barry about that because I wasn't allowed to talk to Barry about my, <laughs> That's my right. performance. Don't tell me. Barry yes. got in touch with me th through Stacy Sher. Okay. Okay. Who used to run DeVito's company and now she does uh, Tarantino's films and stuff. Producer. Yeah. Um, she called me and said, Barry Sonnenfeld would like to talk to you, but he's nervous that you're going to talk to him about acting. <laughs> and I had never met Barry. So, of course, I mean, once you meet Barry, you totally understand. Why he would ask a question that way. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I'm like, you know, what, huh? Uh, uh, what is it? He goes, she goes, well, would you, you know, would you feel comfortable with not talking about acting? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I guess, you know. And uh, she goes, okay, well, I'll tell him. And I think he wants you to look at this, this script and he wants you to play the bad guy in it or whatever. And so I go, great. So I get the script and I'm at some diner in, off a of sunset somewhere and, and I'm reading it and it's a fucking alien, you know. And there's no description of anything other than, you know, he, he steals this guy's skin and he puts it on him and and then he you know and then the story goes on and um and i'm like i can't talk to the director about it you know it's like yeah this is insane this is like a bad joke like they want me to play an alien but i'm not allowed to talk to the director about it <laughs> an alien who's stolen a man yeah uh skin and clothes what does he sound like what is how does he move like what 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 he doesn't know what it means to be a human so, exactly, I wish you had been there <laughs> to say this to Barry. I could have, yeah. Um, but at the same time, I had I'd seen Get Shorty, and I was like, you know, God, I have to do this. It's like, okay, yeah, I, I, I want to do this movie. And as a cinematographer for the Coen brothers. Oh, my God, Jesus. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so... You know, I said yes, and then I was off on my own. I had to come up with all this stuff, and um, the walk and the the frustrating aspect of him being having to be in a human outfit and 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 how disappointing it was at times. Yeah, and so that I had to come up with that, and then and then the actual walk. Um, I I I watched. Uh, you know, this is going to sound so actory, but um, I. I bored myself to almost death watching bug documentaries, and I was I was sitting I'm sitting at my on my couch and I'm watching this thing and I'm I'm watching this beetle bug cross this porch, and the camera's like zooming in slowly on it, and I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? This is so <laughs> fucking boring. Oh my god! And so I just said, forget, I'm not gonna do that. Like, there's nothing to help me there, you know. And I, I was actually 
I actually, it was, you know, I was kind of up in the air what I was going to do. So I was walking um, from the gym and I passed by this uh, sporting goods store. And in the sporting goods store, they had these knee braces basketball players wear. Mm -hmm. And I, it just, I thought, fuck, I could wear those and I could tape them off so that I'm constricted. So I bought two of them, one for each leg. And I went home and I got some sticks for my feet and duct taped my feet so I couldn't rotate my feet. And I bent my knee slight, stood up, bent my knee slightly and duct taped the braces off so I couldn't bend my legs up or like I couldn't straighten them or collapse them. And then I just tried to walk and suddenly I had it. Yeah. And then the voice was, uh, it, you know, pond skull, you know, it's, it's kind of John Huston. You know, yeah. But it had to be faster because it was just too slow. So I combined George C. Scott and John Huston's voice, and that's how I came up with that. And then I had to do it on the first day of shooting when nobody knew that I was what I was going to do. Especially and Barry. how exhilarating is that? <sighs> you know, he stopped. Because first take, to be clear, those of you watching and listening, to be clear, take one of everything is. Oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck. So then let's add to that this a extraordinary thing. <laughs> a, a, a level of absurdity. Yeah. To everyone outside of the pocket you've been living in. Right. In, in duct and they're all not around. With duct tape. And you're like almost going to cry. Right. Yeah. And after the first take, what happened? He stopped. I don't think we completed the first take. <laughs> And, and he said... He said, can we talk? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Barry, I didn't realize we were allowed to. <laughs> Should have been your comment. And uh, I can't remember if he cleared the set mm -hmm. or if we went outside. Mm. But we were standing, I remember us standing alone. And... Um, thank you. Uh -huh. And uh, he said, can, can, you, can you do that again? Can you do that again? You know. <laughs> and I, I do it again, and I do the dialogue, and, and he goes, uh, are you going to do that the whole movie? <laughs> the whole film? And I'm like, yeah, that, that's it. This is it. This is the extent of my talent. Like, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, um, this is, is there a way to do it less? And I'm like, um, and so I do it again, and I'm like, well, this is, this is it. Like, I've have, I have, I don't know if you know, but under my costume, I have my legs tied off and everything. And I said, no, I, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> and he, and he's, he just, he made me do it one more time, and he, he asked me to do it one more time, and. Um, he said, it's, he goes, it's, this, is, this is either um, not going to work or it's going to be great. <laughs> he goes, let's just try it. So we just, try, we just kept on doing it. And then he never said anything to me after that. Ever again. So like every day for like two weeks, I'm thinking, oh, today is when I get fired. <laughs> like they haven't had the meeting yet. They haven't had time because the screening schedule, they're, they're going to have the meeting, Spielberg. and Sure. And uh, someone's going to ask, what is he doing? Yeah. yeah. And uh, that day, just, it just never came. And, Interesting. And that's how I ended up doing it. Uh, I don't know if, what your feelings towards the uh, film Night Shift with Michael Keaton, your feelings are. Um, yeah. Ron Howard told me that he would get calls daily from the studio saying, what the fuck is he doing? <laughs> He's all over the place. Who else can we get to do this? Yeah. Um, it is those unique, overly used, outside the box uh, uh, choices that sometimes. Yeah, but you have to, you know, in, in my, from my perspective, you know, Barry Sonnenfeld suddenly turns into my savior because he went with it. Mm. And once you get to know Barry, you realize that him his way of communicating at times can be just do it 
you know, just do it. So I think he, it clicked for him and he just had me do it as much as I could after that. Right. And there's and never a moment when watching the film where you don't think this is an alien. Yeah. That, I mean, that's the success of what you set out to do. Yeah, I guess There's never true. a moment where you go, hey, there's, a, there's an actor in a wardrobe doing shtick. Right. Ever. Right. It's so uncomfortably uh, uh, physically and, yeah. and audibly yeah. that you're, you're watching the embodiment and failing miserable. This, this alien is one of the worst human impersonators that ever lived. Yeah. <laughs> he just sucks beyond belief. Yeah. And weirdly, is okay with that. Yeah, I don't think he knows the There's difference. There's no self-awareness <laughs> right. uh, just how horrible he truly is. Right. He's And committed. As committed as you were as an actor. He's committed to his journey, yeah. He's committed to impersonate. He made the choice, let's not forget that, <laughs> to take this man's outer layer, including wardrobe. Yeah. I'll fool them. <laughs> he must have thought at some point, <laughs> they won't know I'm an alien. So he's also a bit of a, a dimwit yeah. in that regard. Yeah. Not he's, the smartest. He's a cockroach. <laughs> well, let's not forget. Yeah. He is, uh, even to his own planet, a yeah. cockroach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, just not a bright guy at all. Just instantly obvious <laughs> that something's wrong. <laughs> and it's not duct tape. Yes. And I think, I think that's why it works in this kind of absurd way, you know. Yeah. I think that's what Barry probably thought, okay, it works in this absurd. The movie is a beautiful cartoon come to life. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it, it's almost impossibly good, that film. On it's so many, really good. On so many levels. Yeah. What it accomplishes. Um, that was uh, Barry Sonnenfeld's famous question. Don Cheadle's famous question was, although we worked on the same film, Brooklyn's Finest, we didn't meet. No. My question for him is, how crushing was it for you that we didn't meet? <laughs> I'm sure it was devastating. I would have been. <laughs> well, I, Don Cheadle is one of my favorite actors. Wow. Yeah. Um, because he is, uh, his, his commitment is extraordinary in that kind of subtle way where you never you just don't feel like he's he's acting mm -hmm. and so there's like a it's not it's, it's not an easy thing to do to commit that much and still get away with it you yeah. know with an audience but my answer to his question is i haven't thought about it once okay good yeah. well <laughs> much yeah listen yeah that's all we asked for yeah nor we, did i think about it while we were doing the movie <laughs> <laughs> when am I going to? Was not. No. No. In fact, I had forgotten that he was in the movie at all. Uh huh. Like it. Um, uh, there was a time in your life when all anyone wanted to talk about was, oh my God, what was it like to work with Stanley Kubrick? And you go through being. Um, fresh out of ways to answer the question, I imagine. And then I, I, my hope is enough time has passed. And as we get older, I, the, I don't want to really talk about that. I do that. have things to say about it. Yeah. I do. Yeah, good. Because how many... Well, it started my career. There's no... There's yeah. no... If it wasn't it's keys Stanley to the Cooper, castle. who knows? Yeah. Right. And also, keys to the castle given to you by... Yeah. One of... A phenomenal filmmaker. Three or four... Mount Rushmore level, yeah. singularly original, mm. yeah. Uh, so how does how does that go down? So, so uh, according to the research, mm. uh, you you ha put together a, a self made videotape it's because of Modine. I was uh, um, bouncing and bodyguarding in New York at the time. I was very young. I was. 23 or something like that. And uh, having studied acting for. Still studying acting, still doing plays. Right. Broad, I did Broadway. And, but I, I would never quit my day job or my night job in this matter. The bouncing. Yeah. And um, him and his wife, Carrie, were walking by one day. And uh, we, had, we had known each other from auditions. And I think we went to a class together at some point. And um, 
I just I just saw him. I said, "Hey, Matthew, how you doing?" And we got to talk. And he said, "I'm I'm, you know, going off to do this thing in in London." And you know, and he said, "There's a part available. You should audition. A lot of people are auditioning, but you should audition for it." And I said, "Okay." I said, uh, "He goes, well, I'll get you the information." So I went. Um, sure enough, he got me the information where to send the tape. And so me and my friend Steve Marshall, who was an actor that I grew up with in New York. Um, we rented a video camera, and back then they were like that big, you know, and they had the deck that you had to carry and everything. Sure. Yeah. And uh, we rented all that stuff and a tripod, and I sat on 10th Avenue and 21st Street on a stoop, and we... Uh, a stoop chosen specifically because? Just because I didn't have anywhere else to shoot. Oh, okay. And, I, and the monologue that I was doing was a very New York kind of monologue. Right. From a... From a... Uh, some kind of local play or something and uh involving I, cops according to the research but you left out the reference to cops yes because yeah, there exactly, was some yes. sort of military essence to right it. Yeah, yeah right exactly that and uh that's so funny i hadn't thought of that in a long time that's very right that's jason mcintyre on research that's really good yeah is, is he a person or did you just say that yes. it's like a i say that yeah. to the lights oh, okay yeah that's awesome no he's our research producer okay. he sits up there and runs thank the you jason casting. that was yeah. awesome yeah. um so I do this. I did this monologue, and uh, we. I did a bunch of takes, and I don't. Th I don't think we edited it. But uh, I sent it off, and uh, a few weeks later, I was living in uh, Hoboken at the time, and um, you know, I got this call directly from this guy who said he was Stanley Kubrick's assistant, and uh, I'm like, okay, okay, and then <laughs> Stanley gets on the phone and. I thought that he was British. Like, I didn't know that he was from the Bronx. I didn't know enough about him. I'd right. seen all his movies, but I didn't know anything about him. And uh, so as soon as he said hello, I just, I just fucking hung up. Did you? Yeah, I thought it was so stupid. Like, <laughs> Who'd you think it was? One of my bouncer friends fucking around. Because you would maybe that he let met them know. some English guy that could, because they were always doing shit. Like, Fuck. I could see them fucked up somewhere. I could go call him. You're English. Call him. You know, you did this Stanley Kubrick. Sent this he's Stanley totally Kubrick gonna tape away. Yeah, exactly. And we're gonna, he's going to yeah. talk and go yeah. on and on. Oh, yeah. oh, Mr. Kubrick, that's all we need. Exactly. Um, but then I got, I got the call back, and uh, they, they called back, and they said, please don't hang up. It's Stanley Kubrick. <laughs> and so I talked to him, and uh, he said, I'm going to send you some words, and I want you to make another tape. And... Uh, and so you realized it was yeah Stanley Kubrick. Yeah, you thought. I was I was thinking, well, this is this is amazing. I'm never going to get this, but it's amazing. Yeah, that I'm talking to this guy. Yeah, but I can't like life doesn't work this way. Right. And that I will do everything he says. Right. But um, I'm a bouncer at this theater at the time and I couldn't I was too young and naive to see anything past that right and uh, I didn't have those kind of hopes and dreams like I just didn't hmm. I, I had I was studying really really hard and my hopes and dreams was to just not get laughed off a of stage right you know and uh, this was so far beyond that that it was surreal yeah it had to have been yeah so I he I waited I, I in a few in, a, in about a week I got the this letters Manila envelope and uh, it had words it, there was no punctuation or anything it was just these words and um, Steve and I we did it again in the, in the backyard of my Hoboken place and against this fence because I could tell that it was like a war thing a boot camp thing. So we did it against this metal fence, and he, he, uh, there was these lines, and I was supposed to say them, and then, so I did, and then, uh, then, then I, and then he, the next call, he asked me to come to England, for the, that I got the part that he wanted me to he play. He got the on the phone again the next, it's just astonishing. Yeah, a week, another week or so later, and then asked me to come out, and then I would do the thing, and I said, well, I don't have an agent or anything. He goes, well, you'll have one now. That'll be easy. You'll get one. Just tell somebody, and you'll get them. <laughs> and, I, and so I did. I went to uh, Johnny Planko. He used to be at uh, William Morris at the time, and uh, 
he was my first agent, and I, I went to his office and I said, look, I'm, I have one of the big parts in Stanley Kubrick's movie, and I said, I need representation. And he's like, okay, sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for bringing it here. And yeah, uh, yeah. and and um, and he was he was very helpful because I didn't know anything about anything. Sure. And he had, he was a, had been in the business for a long time and one of the best agents around at the time. How did you have the wherewithal to walk into his office? Um, just, you know, sticking my nose, you know, in, in the trades and, you know, paying attention to, to things that I'd never paid attention to before sure. and realized that maybe William Morris sounded cool, you know, would be a good, yeah. you know, William Morris You'd agency. seen Bugs Bunny walk through the lobby of a hotel. Yeah. <laughs> and just, I figured, you know, this will be a good place. And, uh, I went out there and he said he said to start eating start eating yeah and uh he said start eating before i went out yeah i was gonna yeah and so when i got there i just looked like i could he he said i just looked like i could kick everybody's ass and that i was gonna have to put on more weight and so i did and i got up to uh 270 something pounds yeah which was which was 60 lot. 70 more pounds than normal yeah like more like 80 more pounds than normal at the time. I mean, I was Oof. really... People uh, 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 like to think that putting on that kind of weight sounds uh, great. You just eat donuts and ice cream? It wasn't so great. It wasn't so Because suddenly you can't bend over. You can't do anything, and you get treated differently, and, you know, it's... Uh, yeah, you, you were mentioning that in some of the research, that instantly... Yeah. Uh, less attention from ladies. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, you know, you don't get good tables at restaurants and, you know, you, you don't, you can't, uh, people think you're a little less intelligent. Sure. You know, I mean, this was, you have to remember, there was no, like, computer nerds then or anything. There's, people didn't think of nerds as being cool then. And so it was the first time I was really, since I was a kid, I was a chubby kid, so I knew what, what it was like to be, to be heavy. But, uh those days were long gone by then and and uh um so yeah so it was it was a lonely time out there in england but it was i had matthew there as a friend and and um you know i started working and i and i and i did it and i i saw people getting fired around me on on and i just never i always felt that stanley liked me and that i wasn't going anywhere and i was he built my confidence and, and... Yeah, unlike Barry, was he talking about acting in the No, he doesn't talk about anything. Oh, okay. Yeah, never. Never says anything about it. Doesn't want to know, doesn't want to hear anything about it. And after takes, there'd be direct. Just do it better. Do it better. That was, that was not right. Do it better. Would be his direction. Yep. That was not right. Do it right. better. Do it faster. Because um, do it better is not terribly helpful. No, but you're, you're, you're fucking up. You know, this, that's, it's not working. You guys have to make this work. And it, it puts a pressure on you that, that you kind of you use that pressure to... Because I was thinking that, that terminology, that exact verbiage, mm. undermining, in a sense, does feed the character you're playing in this particular role. It does, but, it, you know, he, he was pretty much like that with, with everybody. I want to make it clear that he... He had, he had one actor do two days worth of takes and on a megaphone would say, um, he had this thing where he would clear his throat <coughs> before he spoke, he had, it was almost a tick sort of. And uh, um, it's, it's take uh, 72, um, that's just no fucking good. Let's go to take 73, you know. And no attempt to be funny, let's be clear. As funny as it is to hear it now. No attempt to be no funny. No one was laughing on that set. So you had to come up with the goods or you were not going to have a good time. Two days in one, for one actor in one scene. Yeah, yeah. So the stories of... And the, you know, to, to be fair, the scene wasn't working. I was sitting right next to Stanley while it was going on and feeling bad for everybody. But the scene wasn't working. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because you hear stories about someone like that, a averaging 70 takes, and you just think, well, at some point that just becomes 
a thing. It, it becomes a big thing, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, Modine and I and Arliss Howard, I think, I think the most, we never did stuff like that. I think the most takes that I ever did was like 11. There's a scene in the movie that people call the blanket party where they hit me with soap. And I think we did that 11 times because it was a big shot. Everybody had to get out of their bunks. The camera slid across the barracks with everybody getting out. Everybody had to get around the thing. It was a big, it was a big deal. And it was a steady cam shot. And, and they're hitting you actually with? Styrofoam, uh -huh. wrapped in towels. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And we did that 11 times, I think. It, it, it was either nine times or 11 times, but it was a big number. And uh, but That's not a Kubrick big number. No. That's a regular film. Yeah, yeah. But you know, the, 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 the scene, the big scene where I shoot the guy and then I shoot myself, I shoot the sergeant and then shoot myself, that we did three times, you know. And then we did the, you know, there was no CGI back then, so they, you know, they just blow this sponge of uh, t tissue and bloody thing with a little mayonnaise in it or something on against the wall, go, you know, past my head to hit the wall behind my head. And they did it once and it worked. <laughs> It was like, okay, this is awesome. <laughs> you did that scene only three times. I did the performance three times. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But the kill shot once. I think the kill shot was once. I don't remember ever doing it more than once. And I think Matthew did his side only a couple of times too. And uh, and I think you know I think the sergeant got killed. I mean that was a very we did that in an afternoon. That That's scene. crazy. We did it in an afternoon, and the night the night before that. This is a story that I've told before, because it's the only really story that I have when Stanley spoke to me about acting. And so I'll tell it again if you want. Please. It's just, I just want you to know it's not exclusive to your... I don't. <laughs> I, don't expect, I don't have those sort of expectations. Please. My questions get to be one of a kind. <laughs> um, we're walking, the day, the day before we shot that scene, right. we're walking back, uh, back to, the, we're walking to our cars, and Stanley is uh, behind me, and uh, it's just him and I, and I think Modine, or, or somebody that somebody that I had become friends with, and uh, I heard, <coughs> you know, him clears, <laughs> and so I knew he was going to say something. We don't know anyone like that, do we? Clears your throat like a tick. <coughs> I think he's our research producer. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> Out of boy, own it. So we, I stopped and I, I turned to look and he was, in fact, he was talking to me, he was about to talk to me and he said, do you know what you're going to do tomorrow? And that's the first time that had happened. Yeah. And uh, I said, yeah, I, I think so. And this is like one of those moments in, in our business that are, it's like Christmas. It's like magic. It's like something like that. Like You've been waiting. Yeah, because... You can't, you can't make this shit up, what I'm about to tell you. Okay. So, um, he goes, uh, are you sure? And I said, yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty set, you know. Um, he goes, uh, <clears throat> he goes, it has to be good, and it has to be really good. And I'm like, well, I'm hoping, Stanley, you know. I've been with him for like 13 months already, you know, and so I knew him pretty well. And I'm like, I'm hoping, Stanley, I'm hoping it's going to, work for you, you know. Um, I didn't feel like, you know, like I was about to cry or anything by then, but when I was speaking to him, I felt, you know, like he was a, like I knew him. After 13 months. Yeah. And he said, okay, it has to be big though. It has to be like Lon Chaney big. And I said, okay. And I was, this thing happened inside me that was like Christmas or because at home, at my, at my flat, I had about 15 Lon Chaney films on video. Because, because of you were obsessed scene. with him at the time? No, because of this scene. Because I always saw Leonard Lawrence turning into a monster. I always saw him as a monster. And I your reference for that I always saw him that, as a weak-minded person that was that switched from being a country bumpkin to a monster, like his wires got crossed in the training, mm -hmm. and they made a monster instead of a soldier. Absolutely. That's how I saw it. And it's a very, 
when I think back at it, I probably wouldn't have made the right, right that same choice today. But I think it's, it, it came from a very inexperienced, very simple way of looking at it. And I think it was exactly right. Yeah. And um, I was so ready that it was unbelievable. And I didn't say a word. You know, I just... Uh, I just so you on your own had decided to get all these Lon Chaney films so that you could prepare for the moment that yeah. he says yeah, just the night Lon before. Chaney. I had about ten Lon Chaney films. I had Godzilla films and King Kong films. Monsters. Monster movies. Yeah. You had already been working with them, and he says to you the night before, "It needs to be, you know, whatever that is you've been working big, on. Big. It has to be Lon Chaney big. And also, it needs to be whatever that is you've been working on. Yeah. Is what he's also saying. Yeah. You know all that work you've been doing? That's what I need you to do tomorrow. Yeah. That's the Christmas. Yeah. That's the, the Christmas is, is that I actually... On your own at 23, not knowing shit from China. Was thinking the same thing as Stanley Kubrick. That to me is like one of those things that has only happened uh, maybe again once in my whole career. Yeah. You know, just like, fuck. You know, I... Damn it, I got it. Like, I was so psyched. I went home, I called my teacher, you know, back in, he, back, she, was, uh, uh, she was in Los Angeles at the time, um, who is still my mentor to this day. And I called her and I, I told her what had just happened. And I, cause, you know, because I told her what kind of work I was doing. And she was supporting me on it and everything. I said, you'll never believe what just fucking happened. He told me to fucking do, a, do it as big as Long Chaney. And la like, it was like amazing. It was amazing. How often during the 13 months had you and her spoken? Several times. Because I needed confirmation. I was too inexperienced. I needed confirmation. I'm like, because um, it didn't remind me of anything movie that I had seen. No. So I, How I, could it? Right. So I wanted to know, am I doing, is, is you sure, you know, I'm using this nursery rhyme in my head for most of it. And that I would, I had three blind mice going on in my head the whole time during every scene that, any dialogue scene that he had, I had three blind mice constantly like in a monotone, very kind of dark three blind mice thing going on in my head the whole time. And I, and you know, so I was doing all this stuff and she goes, no, just fucking do it. You know, be confident and you know. Spectacular. Shall we name her? Sharon Chatton. She still has classes here in Los Angeles and she's amazing. And I, I these days when I'm in town, when I'm not in Valencia, um, shooting, El Camino Christmas, um, I take her classes over and I teach them. Holy shit. Yeah. Uh, uh, Los Angeles, <laughs> look into that. <laughs> Call yourself a wannabe actor. Um, wow. Wowzy, wow, wow. It's a pretty cool thing. Yeah. Um, and so when that did next day comes and you do as big as Lon Chaney. He didn't say anything to me. Right. Um, I, there were these in this, I remember in this um, studio where we were shooting, which is, was basically an old barracks, I mean an old gas works joint mm -hmm. place where they, it, where they blew up and everything. There were these um, buildings um, that they had turned into a studio and in the buildings were these giant cement, you know those, you see them on construction sites, they're big round hollow pillars, they're made of cement where mm -hmm. you can s walk into them. Like, like tunnels. Yeah. And they're just, they were just around, and so they put pillows in there for us to hang out. And I would go to one of those, and, I, and nobody would bother me. Everybody knew that, that I was this like, certain kind of um, kid. And uh, I would go in there, and I would do the nursery rhyme, and that's what I did that day. And, and uh, I had all this, this, this physical thing that I was just planning on doing. And, and by then, the, um, we had already shot the scenes where he, would, he, would, he does this thing where he, f if you're playing somebody bad, he keeps raising the camera and tells you not to tilt up at it, but, but look at a mark. That's how he gets that Malcolm McDowell thing and everything. And so I was combined. I knew he was going to do it to me on that day. So I, I had incorporated it into what I was doing. And, uh, and, 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 and in fact, he did. Um, keep it up pretty high. But by this time, I knew how to play. It was 13 months in. I knew how to play with the camera. I didn't know how to. No. And so 
by that time, I, my posture fit it so he didn't have to manipulate my performance like he was doing earlier on in the shoot. And um, yeah, he, and, and so we would do, we, when we finished the three takes, and we, he was very happy because the, um, the effect was worked the first time. Or, sure. So, and so he said, do you want to watch them? And uh, I'd never considered watching myself. And so he said, I'd really like you to sit down and watch him. So he had, you know, back then he had the monitor that he had was, the screen was about like that big, but it, it was, so it was also long, like behind it was like really long. It was like this miniature screen, but really long. You know, what it took to have that screen, I don't know, in, during the day, uh, back in the day. Yeah. But uh, we're watching it, I'm watching it, and and he's and he we're sitting I'm sitting next to him in the chair he's directly next to me in the in in a director's chair the the small ones and he puts his hand on my hand during one of the takes and I just knew that okay I did it like <laughs> I delivered like cuz I was watching it and to this day I can't tell you what I saw it was just like blah you know I have no idea and uh no but he put his hand on me and I'm like fuck yeah this is what his way of saying yeah and, uh, and that was it. Holy fuck, man. Yeah. Uh, it was pretty cool. Holy fuck, man. Oof. Yeah, I mean, there's the, there's always a little piece of actors being children in a, in a, in a sandbox, in a, in a, right? And wanting dad's approval. And yeah, of course. I think that would be the apex. Yeah. Uh, one of the greatest. Yeah, and you know he was he was he was, especially the guy who's saying, "Well, that was take seventy-two. Yeah, and it's it was horrible. So he really didn't here like seventy-three. It when, he really didn't like it when things didn't work out. He really loved it when they did. And like, let you know. He would genuine genuinely smile. That's how he would let you. Like he would have a smile on his face, and he would he would have this like little Jew from the Bronx excited yeah. thing. You know? Yeah. He just, you could just see it. He loved it. He loved it. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, manzy man, man. Um, did you send me anything? Good. <laughs> the hell with those, <laughs> those jerks. Oh, wait. Jason had a question. Oh, okay. We have a live thing. And, oh, cool. And usually it's, Why did he ask me? you know, your, your trolls showed up. So this is up. becoming like the sidebar, like Jason McIntyre show. He's been mentioned way too much. Oh, today. interesting. Um, earlier in the interview, you were talking about how you, um, I think it was during the troll conversation, how you don't like showboaters. So Jason texts me, he wondered how you deal with fake people in Hollywood, if that's the case. Well, I, it's, a, it's a really good question because I think that, I think that there's a lot of fake people in Hollywood, <laughs> but I also think that people forget that just like in real life, you hang in the circles that you feel comfortable in. And so I don't deal with it a lot. You know, I, and I would, I, and I'm just using the term Hollywood because that's like another term for the business. But the fact is, is that their actors live everywhere and some of them are jerks and some of them are not. And, uh, and I try to not surround myself with jerks. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. Every business has show, oh my God. showboaters. Yeah. Our, yeah, we're not terribly special. However, <laughs> um, I, I have one query, if follow I may. Up. A follow-up question, Please. totally unrelated. As long as we're getting questions out of left field. Uh, a film you did, well, not left field, but, you know, The Crow's Nest. Uh, a film you did in the mid-'90s, Stuart Saves His Family. Mm. The Al Franken movie about the Stuart Smalley character. Yeah, who is one of my hero senators right now. For sure. Yeah. And, and that's such a, that movie was such a, a weird departure from the sketch that it, I think had been born out of on SNL. Yeah. And, uh, and I loved seeing you in that movie because it was such a, it was such an eye-opening, different performance for me as a fan when I saw you in it. Right. And uh, you know, it's this intense movie about alcoholism and the and the and the familial troubles and everything. And you look yeah. so unusual and with the curly hair and the whole thing. And uh, and I'm just wondering if that you know movie kind of resonated uh, with you or with. I loved or... doing it. Yeah. Also directed by Harold Ramis. I was going to oh. say, I was just about to say that just Harold himself, just being around him. Is just amazing. Give he us was, anything. 
about that? He was just an amazing guy, and his he had such a knowledge for timing when when he was dealing. Because for, for with me, I'm an, I was a non comedic actor. I, I still am. I mean, I can do comedy, but it's not like you guys. I, I just I just don't. You guys are a certain breed, and sure. I'm not that breed. Yeah. I assume you mean Jews. I, I mean <laughs> co I mean comedians. Fuck with you. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and um, he his timing was just so freaking good that um, he would say, you know, when he, he loved everything I was doing, but he would say on this particular thing when when Al says this, you know, you have to be. This is your timing for that. This is when you come in. There's it's not just one beat; it's a beat and a half. Oh, you know. And uh, you know you're you you're you know so it would it, he was so helpful and I would just sit next to him the whole day yeah because he was he had amazing stories about being wheeled around and when they were shooting uh, the the old films that he used to do with Bill Murray and stuff and you know everybody was so messed up that they would wheel them around on um, hand carts from place to place. <laughs> And by messed up, of course, you mean yeah, high, yeah, yeah. And I just pictured the two of them being wheeled around on hand carts. I don't think I've ever heard that. Yeah, it's spectacular. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's directly from Harold's mouth. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Kenny, that's something to aspire to. We were so messed up, they would get us about in hand trucks. I think is what we're talking about. Mm. The movers. Why did he look to Kenny? Why? <laughs> I think he knows. <laughs> and uh, yes, please. Uh, it's just fun, and and Al was also very sweet to me. And they they were they, they were just, it was just an amazing film to work on because of the it was my first introduction to professional comedy, like the big guys. Like, yeah, you know what I mean. Like sure. Al had been writing for so long by then up for SNL and and. Uh, and his making, he's making his own movies and stuff. And, and Harold was 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 very successful at the time, and funny as hell, and also a good actor, Harold. Mm -hmm. and so to 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 work with these guys was extraordinary for me. I I soaked it all up like a sponge. Yeah, yeah. And they knew it, you know. And, and you guys know it. You guys know when you're good. You guys have this thing that you guys do that you know you're good. And uh, <laughs> you have that thing that you do because you know you're good. Yeah. And it's, I think it's extraordinary, and I, I... It's probably just stage presence. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, when you trust your instincts in a live staged performance as a Broadway actor, mm -hmm. and the audience's reaction is instant, and then over time you start to develop confidence based on your instincts being confirmed, and then it's that times a million for a uh, comedian, certainly, because yeah. it's just live all the time. Yeah. Um, and it's just something that I could never be, it's not part of my uh, deal. It's like, I, I'll never learn that. It's a different yeah. make. I can be directed to do that, but it's not instinctual, like it is with you guys, because of this 10,000 hours yeah. issue. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's all it is. Yeah. Um, from the experience, a couple things. Kill the Irishman. Everyone loves a good Christopher Walken story. Did anything come from? N nothing. Like I don't. I. Uh, I don't do an impression of him or no, anything. No. And and and. Not know. necessary. <laughs> no, but I know that. That you have a very famous one. And. And. Uh, but he was just really sweet to me. And. Um, I'm always, I meet these actors who I've looked up to for so long, right. were, who were the generation before me, and um, you know, every time I meet them, I'm always just amazed by how sweet they are to me, and right. how nice they are to me, and you know, um, they also don't talk a lot, right. um, you know, and, and that, that suits me just fine, you know, and... Uh, when you meet heroes, um, I think the first thought is you just don't want to be off put by a, a fantasy version of them being shattered. Right. So when they actually have compliments towards your work, um, it, start, it resonates in a way that doesn't exist in normal life. It really does. Yeah. It really does. Um, 
And that's so true. And so he was like that to me. He was super kind. And when we were doing a scene together, which was, I think we just did one scene together, you know, he fell into, we, we fell into the way that we do things um, very naturally. And he immediately, um, our blocking immediately was in sync with each other. Um, a lot of times when there are actors that have this kind of actory reputation, a lot of times you get left to do your own blocking. Mm. Um, even though the director might have something in mind of like if he wants to shoot in this direction and this direction, you use that as your stage and then you block within that, you know? Right. And uh, um, I, it's one of the things I noticed that our blocking fell in really natural with each other's and and you know we didn't really say much. He, we sat next to each other for hours, but we really didn't say much. And I'm very similar to that. I don't really talk a lot. And and um, and uh, he left a bottle of wine at my door with a little note, like very classy, very you know. It just made me smile, and you know, really yeah. really classy. He taught me a little bit of class that day, and uh, um, that's the only th story I really that's have. That's a great one. Yeah. Yeah, unless you're talking about cooking, he's he's a man of few words. We we, we saw him uh, in the McDonough play at Behanding in Spokane and went up and just said hello afterwards. And, nice. and there was not a lot of conversation. All I took from that meeting was that he labeled all his personal belongings with duct tape that said C period walk-in. Uh -huh. And that like idiosyncrasy like really stuck out to me. <laughs> I, items like what? Like a duffel bag. Sure. But it was really just a piece of duct tape that he wrote on with like a sharpie, and it said "C period walk in." Uh -huh. I don't but, know. I don't know. Yeah, that's what that's I like a theater thing, though. Yeah, that's like we all do that. It's like a not not all of us, but it's a theater thing because you if you're sharing a space with a lot of other actors, makeup you get dis used to makeup that. disappears, and you get used to that. It's interesting. He obviously had his duct own dressing tape. room, and he still did it <laughs> yeah, out, yeah, of, yeah. out of the yeah. ritual. <laughs> Yeah, labeling a everything. A label maker, yes, but duct tape. No, it's funny. <laughs> it's, <laughs> funny. <laughs> it's awesome, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I meant. I but you know, like brushes, you know, makeup oh, so brushes, and, and you know, things disappear. Sure. Yeah. Oh, I know. I've had. I've lost many a thing in that uh -oh. green room. There yeah. we go. Props. You know, oh. you buy, spend money on props, and then they like they, they go in the green room and they never come out. Had you have gotten a piece of duct tape and a magic well, marker? That's it. That's the answer. <laughs> there's your I'm going to have to labor with the Fish bulb. Um, there's been so many. I'd be remiss if I didn't say your character in the Salt and Sea was Pooh Bear. Yeah. Oh man. Just there. Th there's a clinic. Just watch some of that over and over again. There are certain performances that you just go, okay. Well, here's something <laughs> from another world <laughs> and another form of life that hadn't crossed my mind. I'm going to get lost in it. I have to again. I have to give Val and DJ Crusoe the credit for for being open. I mean, DJ DJ wanted me to play the part so bad, and I had just done the cell, and I didn't feel like playing another shithead. And uh, but then I was I was doing a film. I was doing. A, movie I did about these boys with Jodie Foster. I forgot the name of it. And Dangerous doing Lives of Alter Boys? Dangerous Lives of Alter Boys. And uh, I'm doing that and he calls me and he says, you know, I really want you to do this thing. And I'm just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I, I said, I'll read the script again. And so I read it again. And I took it um, to this park and uh, in Charlotte. And this guy threw down a blanket with his girlfriend next to me, and he was Pooh Bear. Like, exactly. Uh, he had the nose. He had a nose, <laughs> but but he he had blonde spiked hair um, with black tips and uh, no black hair with blonde tips. He had a little goatee, black goatee. Um, he was wearing shorts and a, a Dead Kennedys T-shirt with um you know army boots and i'm like okay i'm like oh okay i could do this so i called him immediately when i got back to the hotel and i said look there's two things um i'm going to put on about 20 maybe 25 pounds 
I said, um, I have this look that I have in mind. It's a black goatee with you know blonde tips. Um, and I want the line, there was one line that another character set. I said, have you cast the other character yet? And they said, no. I said, good. Can I say, put your pee pee in the hole? I want that line. And he said, yes. And so I did it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Wowzy wow. Yeah. Some, and uh, Sometimes that connection just happens. <laughs> for whatever reason, yeah. Sat down next to you on a blanket in a park. Yeah. Because you chose to go to that park that day. Yeah. To read a script. Yeah, and he was like perfect. To and read a script that you didn't want to do. Yeah. And uh, tough and then, not to think about higher powers and universes when right, shit like that right. happens. So, so then during the shoot, um, you know, these two guys, um, Val and, and and DJ, they were so open to anything that I had to bring. There's so much improvisation in that. Um, there's so much dialogue that I made up um, beforehand that I had just written out myself. Um, he let me go on about brains and about... Um, yeah, there's a free association there's, there's thing aspect that, the to The thing when I pick up the, the two... Um, oven gloves and I say you know so I you know like a dog you know <laughs> and and all that that's that's all stuff that they just let me you know wing yeah yeah and the reason why you know I, I mean I just for people that aren't on sets as much as we are because I know you know this you know the idea of that kind of tone being set where there's no ego there's no um, hold up there's no negativity in the fact that you're creating mm. um, and that and that there's nothing but positive you know stuff being thrown at you you know you can't lose in those situations no. yeah oh man um, sadly you're gonna have to come back because there's so much more and um, I could go on like I'll come this. Back. oh great yeah four hours um, I can't thank you enough, honestly and truly. I hope you enjoy the rest of your time in Valencia. Thank you. And then in Vancouver. Yeah. And I'll text you the restaurant. Yes, please do. Yeah. It's been great being here. Um, uh, yeah. So, uh, we end the show in an odd way. Okay. Yeah. We're going to draw upon some of those improvisational skills of yours. Uh-oh. Okay. Yeah. It's called the Larry King Game. We invite you to play. All right. The Larry King game is uh, pretty straightforward. Um, it starts with you doing a bad Larry King impression, so there's no pressure to, to actually sound like him. I only like bad ones. And then it's that moment right before Larry goes to the phones where he looks down the barrel of the camera and he shares something about himself that no one needed to know, and I mean no one. Mm. He likes Oreo cookies or his first ride on a pterodactyl, whatever the fuck it is. So it's about Larry, a little piece of Larry that he insists on sharing. No one needs. And then he goes to the phones. And they feel free to name out a city that he goes to, whatever comes to mind. There's your camera. That's all we need you to do when you are ready. Bad Larry King impression. He shares something that no one needs to know. He goes to the phones. And that was a wonderful interview. Um, let me go to the phones. I just want to say that the uh, I've run out of the bleach that gets rid of the stains on my underwear. And um, it's, it's caked up, and I feel it as I'm speaking now. <laughs> and Arkansas. <laughs> yes, people. That's how you play the Larry King game. And by the way, when you're searching for uh, uh, who do, who's on the phone, pick a state. Yeah. I, 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 I salute that. <laughs> Open it up. Uh, thank you, man. Mm. Uh, and now please sit there and come to me while I wrap things up for the folks at home and around the globe. Sammy and Jamie, thank you as always. Samantha Ward, so great to have you back, and thanks for the assist on today's guest. Uh, evil Dr. Kenny Chen, thanks for getting it done, as you do. Mike Duman up there in the Coast Nest with Jason McIntyre, the aforementioned. Let's Too not forget much. Luke Allen. And our love, again, goes out to Brian. Yeah, he can Venmo me, it's fine. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Corey Levin on the post. Who am I forgetting? I always forget someone. Okay. Somehow, maybe not. Uh, this one's uh, for Brian McCauley. Get well, get better, let us know how we can help. Until next time, and as always, 
Get out of my face.